deeper now. <laughs> uh, we will continue now with uh, the next part, which is about force and matter on the one hand. So I'll, I'll explain a number of typical things that you can say about force and matter from the viewpoint of uh, theosophy. And we will also look uh, uh, to the aspect of motion, the motion of bodies, uh, also from uh, theosophy and from physics. First we will start with uh, force and matter. We should realize that this all concerns living beings that attract or repel each other according to the resonance associated with the inner growth processes. And as said before, forces are not abstract things, but emanational forces flowing from a being and therefore also having, as it were, the color of the, the character of the being from which they flow those forces. To give a simple example, on Earth here we live in the emanation force, force field from our Sun. And according to Theos the Theosophia, forces are formed by a flow of particles arising from a source being. So a, so a force is in fact particles, emotions, colored by the source being and substance of matter or matter is crystallized or solidified force, forces in equilibrium. How does the Theosophia view force and matter? Well, according to, to the Theosophia, force and matter are two sides of the same coin. They are relative. They are in fact also one. And since we assume that there are multiple planes of force or energy and matter, we can look at the following picture. And I have put some names in it and also with different color. Whether something is called a force or matter depends only on the point of view from which you look at it. Something that is force, for instance on the plane I have indicated with three, and I have uh, colored the, the word force with green. If you view this from a lower plane, uh, then you see, if you view that from the, the, the plane number four, then if you look up, then force is, is a force. But if you look at that same plane from plane two, and if you look downwards, then you would call it matter. So it is all a matter of perspective. From which point of view do you look at something? So, and another point that is very important because I will need it to explain things uh, further in the lecture, and that is that viewed from the Theosophia, a force on a higher plane, for instance, plane number one, can make a force on a lower plane, for instance, plane number three, resonate due to a similarity in characteristic. And I will give you a simple example uh, to make it more understandable. If you have two different musical instruments, for instance, a violin and a cello, and you strike a, a tone on each of these instruments, then the same tone will resonate on the other instrument, but on a different octave. So one force at one level will trigger, as it were, a, uh, a force on another level. That is ex uh, actually 
what I want to express here, the analogy with the two instruments, is the same as you have different planes and you have a force on one plane and if you, if you activate that force then it can give a reaction on a completely different plane because there is a resonance between those forces. And that you uh, should keep in mind if we continue later uh, this evening. Now, I've now explained how uh, the definition of force of a matter is from the perspectives of metaphysics or the Theosophia. Now, let's have a look at physics. And I look now at the ideas of mainstream physics, so the existing mentality. And that is very much in line with the Theosophia. Physics assumes, of course, only one plane of matter. Though also it is considered that force and matter are relative and are in fact one. Force is also considered matter in motion. And that is especially studied in the field of quantum physics. And matter is indeed considered crystallized force. The idea that science has about this is that matter and force are convertible in each other. And it's called the law of conservation of energy. And this differs from the Theosophia, which assumes that the force on one plane triggers a force on another plane, and that is a different approach. Um, now, physics also subscribes to the idea that force is matter in motion, and the uh, particles that are representing the force are called messenger, messenger particles of that force. So a force or energy flow is also considered a flow of discrete particles. It is like a flow of water which can be considered as a flow of water drops. And this view is called quantum physics. Quantum is quantity, so the water drops are, are discrete quantities of water, and more about that later on. Now there is another thing I would like to uh, talk about, and that is regarding the emanation of force fields, there is another important aspect. According to the Theosophia, all forces in nature are bipolar. The active, the positive pole, the attracting pole, and the passive or the negative pole, the repelling pole. And we see this uh, naturally with easily with the magnets, with north and south poles. Uh, and the conclusion is that according to the Theosophia, uh, according to the Theosophia, all forces are bipolar. And have an active and a passive pole. In physics, uh, this is different. Not all forces are considered bipolar. For instance, gravity is considered only to have an attracting pole, so there is only uh, attraction, uh, and not a repelling pole. Now there is another important aspect. How should we see the operation of forces in time? On the whole, the Theosophia points out that all manifested expressions of life are subject to cycles, to cycles in time. No matter how fast the exchange may be in our eyes. However, it is understandable from the Theosophia that operation of forces is perceived by us as being so fast that we say that the forces work instantaneously. And in the next slide we, will sh we shall put therefore the term instantaneously between quotes to indicate that. And this is theosophically understandable because we concluded earlier that all living beings in the cosmos are connected to all other living beings. Why is this so important to discuss? 
because physics has long considered how forces at a distance can influence something. It's called the issue of the action at a distance, such as gravity in relation to the orbit, for instance, described by the planets around the Sun. And physics uh, is uh, in general assuming that forces in the macrocosmos, so for instance the forces in our solar system, are limited by the speed of light. In physics, people deal with this issue differently, and I will explain that. Regarding the microcosmos, so the world of the atomic and subatomic particles in the field of quantum physics, one can get along very well with the idea that the exchanges of forces between particles do not depend on place and time and are therefore instantaneous or at least much faster than the speed of light. After all, one assumes non-local behavior where the classical laws of physics no longer apply, mind you. Regarding the macrocosmos, this is completely different in the theory of relativity formulated by Albert Einstein. There all exchange of forces takes place at a speed assumed to be limited by the speed of light. But that is actually, cosmically speaking, a very low speed. It's only 300,000 kilometers per second. And I will give an example to clarify this remark. Take our solar system. The gravitational field within the solar system acts instantaneously, as far as we can see that. For instance, the planet Jupiter moves in elliptical orbit around the Sun. And Isaac Newton, I told you two, two weeks back about him, indeed assumed that gravity without deceleration thus acts instantaneously. But sunlight, which is thus limited by the speed of light, takes 43 minutes to reach Jupiter. So, how to understand that? More about it later. Therefore, in physics, people are looking for how these two different physics visions, quantum physics from the microcosmos, and gravity theory of the macrocosmos can be brought into harmony with each other. And in the Netherlands, the so-called Delta Institute ITP is uh, working on that, but many institutions in the world are trying to bring those two theories in physics together. And it's not easy because they have been working on that for decades already. We will soon see that, according to the Theosophia, the exchanges of force on both microcosmos and macrocosmos follow the same lines and only the scale differs. Now we are going to have a look at motion. And very much in outline, not in, very much in details. It's about the balance of a being when it moves in an emanation force field. First we start a simple one, which I also spoke about two weeks back, and that is the principle of self-motion. Self-motion is characteristic of a living being. This means that uh, we, we can see action, the ability to move on its own accord, together with the ability of reaction, the ability to respond to the actions of other beings. Therefore, the movement of bodies in space, rotating or moving forward in a straight line, such as in a nebula or with comets, planets and galaxies, is already a first indication of life. In physics, 
All motion is attributed to the action of mechanical forces in the world of inanimate matter. Now, when a body, a living being therefore, <coughs> moves in an emanation force field, for example a light particle, a photon as it's called, it is good to realize that according to the Theosophy, yeah, it does not move through a vacuum. In the diagram of uh, manifested fields, the one with the uh, ten planes of existence, I told you that there are four manifested planes on which living beings have their existence, and that each of these planes is sevenfold. The lowest material plane, Earth, is also sevenfold, and the material Earth is enveloped by a sphere that is one stage more ethereal than the substance we know, and that this sphere is the ether that belongs to the Earth. We had it also during uh, the questions when we had an exchange. And although that ether is more ethereal, its substance, it's also matter, its substance is very dense, namely it is 5,000 times denser than lead. And also important to realize is that the denser the medium is, the greater the wave velocity of the propagation of waves in that medium is. Since every being has a composite nature, such as an, an, an uh, aura extension, Extending across the, the four cosmic regions, an atomic particle that moves will also create a stir, a wave, a vortex in the ether. The movement of the particle is the cause and the wave is the effect. And I will explain that a little bit further with this picture here. This is a picture of a wave in water, and you see that the wave in fact is propagating because the uh, water particles over the depth of the uh, water, you see uh, circles or ellipses uh, drawn in the picture, and in fact the water particles stay more or less on the same spot, but they make a circular motion. And because all these water particles at different level of the water body, uh, because they are in a different phase of their circular motion, they pass on the wave. Uh, so it looks like the wave is, uh, is uh, moving, but it is in fact the various motions of the particles, which stay on more or less on the same spot, which make the wave propagate over the surface of the water. And the wave in the ether, if we go back to the ether again, triggers also a wave phenomena or a vortex on the earthly material plane. Think again of the resonance phenomena in musical instruments, of different octave heights. So this effect explains the phenomena in physics that, for instance, a light particle can be described both as a particle and a wave. And this is called in physics complementarity. You can describe the phenomena by either taking the standpoint of it is a particle that is moving or that you can take the standpoint that it is a wave that is propagating. More in general, if we philosophize a bit about this, we can say that the explanation is based on consciousness, could uh, read as follows, that a leading consciousness evokes somewhere a force in the form of a pressure difference, which can also be the case uh, 
for a water body when wind blows over the water for instance so that creates a friction and this friction makes a, uh, a pressure difference or a tension difference if we talk about uh, electrical systems and this force which is uh, uh, started causes motion and creates a wave in the emanation force field and the beings who follow uh, are so-called elemental beings who collectively form or transmit or propagate the wave. So there is a hierarchy of cooperation between higher and lower beings. We see the same in our human society. If there is a very powerful thinking, uh, an influencer we call it nowadays, uh, and when they uh, start a certain thought, then this is followed by a lot of people who are maybe a little bit less independent thinkers and they follow this thought. That's the same idea. In physics, in general, only one plane of matter assume, is assumed in which measurements can actually be done. And this presents various difficulties and issues in explaining the phenomena observed in the field of matter on this one plane of matter. The microcosmos, uh, let's talk about that, uh, indicates how particles sometimes appear as particles and sometimes as waves. As mentioned, this is the field of so-called quantum physics. And in the macrocosmos, we have the gravitational theories and the relativity theory, which assumes that the cosmos is held together by the action of the gravitational force of the masses in the cosmos. And which also assume at the same time a vacuum in space. Now the existence of so-called dark matter and dark energy is assumed by scientists nowadays to explain the observed motions of stars and galaxies in clusters in a way that is consistent with the existing gravitational theory and the theory of relativity of Einstein. Dark matter is thereby a hypothetical type of matter in the universe which is not visible via the electromagnetic radiation that reaches the earth and dark energy is a hypothetical form of energy in the universe that would be responsible for accelerating the expansion of the universe. Based on observations by the Planck Observatory the total mass and energy of the universe is thought to consist of the following figures. 68% dark energy, which is a hypothetical energy. 27% of dark matter, which is also hypothetical. And 5% normal observable matter from our Earth. So here we can say we have a problem because for now to be honest it's difficult to substantiate this gravity theory and re theory of relativity with real actual observations so that's why i have inserted the cartoon dark matter just won't show itself and if you would have another theory of which 95 percent of the data is lacking you would discard this theory, but this is still not the case with these theories. Now, I have announced already that there is also other scientists, which are not mainstream scientists, who have other explanations which are based on electromagnetism, and I will tell you more uh, about that later. Also, there are other theories such as string theories, uh, which uh, is a uh, uh, amalgamation of various theories which are purely theoretical 
And the issue with those theories is that there is not a clear way how these theories can be tested in practice. And according to scientific uh, philosophical starting points, then you have the problem that it is very difficult to call these theories scientific theories. Well, um, there are also other theories, but I will not go into that. Uh, we will have, again, a three minutes break, and we will welcome very much your questions or your remarks, and we will see you in three minutes from now. See you then. Welcome back. Mariska, do we have any questions? We do. And the first question is, is force the same as spirit? Well, um, let me say that um, avoiding a semantic discussion, but uh, we can say if we talk about, uh, for instance, the um, interaction between living beings, for instance, between uh, human beings, then we exchange, we can say in general, influences. Uh, if we, we uh, express an idea, a thought, then we, we, something flows out of our being, which is uh, energizing the idea that we are trying to express, and we tell that to someone. Uh, so we can s actually see that uh, exchange of ideas as an exchange of uh, forces, because we, we sense or energize the idea that we want to uh, express or point out. So then you could use the word uh, force. But um, when we talk about spirit, most of the time we indicate something that is of a higher level that is for us as something like uh, imperishable, that it is something that is uh, above our uh, cyclic uh, existence, which is perishable. So uh, you could say that uh, beings which have a higher, uh, have reached a higher evolution uh, status than we have as mortal beings, they are have for uh, their uh, uh, they have gained the ability that they know something to do with the spiritual side of forces because they are of that higher level that the forces they use are from our point of view. Uh, eternal or imperishable, and then you could call it spiritual. Uh, that is the difference I would like to make, but it is a play of words. In fact, we are talking about the exchange of influences. That would be another common word. Uh, and then every time you have to think and discuss what is the context in which you use which word, I think, then to keep the discussion or the exchange of ideas sharp and clear. Thanks. Yeah. And the next question is, is it right to say that forces are a kind of interaction between beings? Yeah, yeah, that is com completely, I agree with that, uh, that statement, that forces exchange uh, yeah, influences between beings. That's, uh, that's a good... Uh, I completely uh, agree with that uh, image. Yeah. And then the next question. I understood that when in a room the air is taken out as a vacuum and there a light object falls down together with a heavy object, they land on the ground at the same time. How would the metaphysic metaphysicians explain this from their vision? Well, actually, uh, metaphysics is not needed to explain this because this is a matter that is explained fully already in physics because when you have uh, two objects which are in a, in a room filled with air, then uh, because of the shape and uh, the, 
the way they are, uh, the materials uh, they have, although they have the same weight, they may have a very different uh, resistance in the air, and that is why they are falling with a different speed. Mm -hmm. So already within the framework of physics, you can explain those differences. So, um, because this is, uh, this is how within physics, within the framework of our one physical world of matter we are living in, we can explain this. And maybe if you look at it from the metaphysical point of view, and we will come to that in our next part of the lecture, then there are certain phenomena in this physical, one physical plane we exist, that we cannot explain by only sticking to the forces on this one physical plane, but we have to look at other planes as well in order to uh, explain the phenomena. And I will come back to that point later. With, because there are some experience which, which are already classical experience, experiments in physics that uh, cannot be easily explained, or cannot be explained at all. <laughs> and when you stick with this one field of matter, uh, and then comes in metaphysics. But this phenomena can be explained from the field of physics uh, also. Yeah. Thanks. Um, next question is, uh, the tide is the periodic change of the water level. Yeah. So is day and night the periodic change of light? The, the, sorry, the? The tide yeah. is the periodic change uh, uh, of the water level. So is day and night the periodic change of light? Yeah, it is because this is caused by the, the rotation of the Earth around its axis. And that is why uh, every time another side of the globe of the Earth is pointing towards the light of the sun, and that is, that is the cyclicity of the motion of uh, our Earth. It is, it is the motion on a daily basis of 24 hours, the rotation, but also, of course, the rotation in uh, 365 and a quarter of a day around the sun, that we have the, the, the slower variation in the seasons. But there are other cyclic motions, uh, some of them are periodic cycles of 100,000 years, or there is one cyclic motion of around 26,000 years, which is the precession of the, the zodiac. That means that because the Earth also makes a kind of um, uh, this type of rotation, I, I, how is it called? A tall bewegging. Uh, I, I forgot the English word. Uh, uh, because the axis of the Earth makes this rotation once every 26,000 years. So there are various cyclic motions that are taking place at the same time, but they have a different cyclic time. And day and night, light and darkness, are, uh, are uh, related to the rotation around the axis of the Earth. And there are no more questions, but there is one remark. Ah, uh, good. It seems that how more humans want to explain, how more the logic is lost. The theosophical logic seems to be truthful. So this is, I think, someone who can follow your ah, lecture. <laughs> okay, well, I, thank you very much. I, I hope you uh, please come in with more remarks. Uh, uh, also comments that uh, something is not clear or maybe you question some of our uh, points of view because this is uh, this is work in progress you should understand that that the final word uh, about a lot of things is, is not said and, and there is a lot to be done still and I will I am in the next part uh, which we are starting now I will explain that there are a kind of what sometimes in society are called wicked problems in science <laughs> that, that are not easy to uh, to solve and also that there are complete fields in science that try to postulate theories which are sometimes so difficult to 
test, evaluate, and to 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 uh, to show the truth of it, and and that is something that takes decades of thinking and experimenting. And we are going to see a few of those. But I have pointed to them already a little bit, but I'm going to uh, point again to those problems. Now, first I want to explain something. We are now starting with uh, part three of the uh, uh, lecture. So application of metaphysics on theory.